the Lord is good. He's still on the throne. And it is always important that we look away from the mountain, from the challenges of life. As a matter of fact, there's something the Lord said one time, that Christians tend to look at the mountains. They tend to be intimidated by the mountains. But there's nowhere that the Lord asks us to look at the mountains. He asks us to speak to the mountains, whether it is in Mark 11, 20, 2 to 24, or in Zechariah chapter 4, from verse 6 to 10, the command is speak to the mountain. When you see the mountain, don't be intimidated. You will be intimidated if you dwell on the mountain. But when you see the mountain, look beyond the mountain, look at he who created the mountain, who is seated on the throne of majesty, and open your mouth, speak the word of faith to the mountain. The Bible says it will move. Let your word be backed by faith. It has the force of divine law. Speak to the mountains of your life, brothers and sisters. Speak to the situations that seem so difficult, so, um, you know, complicated. Speak and stand speaking. And if you stand speaking, you'll be the last one standing. Brothers and sisters, the Lord has ordained his church to walk in victory. Greater is he that is in the church than he that is in the world. Don't allow your life to be defined by what experts say, whether they are medical experts or whatever type of experts. Yeah, they, are, they have a good work to do, and they are doing a good work. But listen, the day your life becomes, you know, uh, one that is defined by what a man, a human says, by whatever name or title called, that day something terrible has happened to your life. So live above the pay grade of the world. Live above the circumstances that you run into. Live above the challenges and speak to the mountains. Command them in the name of the Lord Yeshua. They shall be moved. Having said that, brothers and sisters, we're going to continue our ongoing study on women in ministry. And this is a cause that is so important because in the body of Christ, the Lord has a large pool of people. In fact, the largest segment of available manpower in the church is the women. And religion has caused the church not to study the word systematically, not to understand the word, to take some things that Paul said for proposal regulation of order in the Alpha Church, the early church, those things he said in First Timothy chapter two, those things he said in First Corinthians chapter eleven and First Corinthians chapter fourteen have been taken out of context in which they were given, which is to bring order to the people who were just coming into the gospel then, and they thought, well, I'm liberated. I don't no longer need to respect my husband. I need longer to be under his, uh, uh, you know, submitted to him. And Paul was telling them, no, 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 no. The instructions were, go and study all of them. They were in the context of a woman whose husband is equally saved and is in the church. And there's a reason why he put it. And that reason has been explored in the last two lessons or last three lessons. So do yourself a word of good. Women in ministry is a cause you cannot afford to take one or and leave the other no, you take all the revelations and the Lord will give you such a wonderful understanding and you'll be liberated from the plan of the enemy. So today, lesson seven, the religious glass ceilings and the great commission. Stay with us as we pray and get into the world today. Father in heaven, you are beyond description. We are grateful for the gift of life. And Lord, we surrender ourselves to your counsel. Let your will be done. Lord, today, give us a measure of your mind. Release it. Grant us understanding and to walk in the light of truth. In Yeshua's name, amen. Brothers and sisters, we start this lesson today with a basic thesis. And that thesis is this, is in quote, by rejection or by rejecting the general call of Elohim, on all sins, the negation 
of the ministry of those in the marketplace, negation of the ministry of youth and women, and insisting on limiting ministry and leadership rose to only a tiny male-dominated priestly caste. Religion has been doing the bidding of Satan. That's the thesis of this lesson today. Now, I want you to understand what he's saying, and I'm going to break it down in a, a moment. So, it is important to know, therefore, that Satan has kind of given the church a loaded gun, loaded with four bullets, to shoot itself in the feet and incapacitate its ability to do the Great Commission. You see, we need to understand something. Satan has what is called wiles and devices. In Ephesians 6, 10, and 11, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of Elohim that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. He has wiles. And these words are such that if you don't guard your heart with all diligence and guard the loins of your mind as Peter recommended, you can fall victim to the wiles of the wicked one and you can be ignorant of it. Number two, he has what is called devices. In 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11, Paul said, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So the wiles and devices of the enemy are the crafted ideas with which he constructs a, a, a system of making Christians ignorant of what he's doing and going about to achieve his objective. So the wiles of the devil and his devices need to be recognized and rejected. Otherwise, binding to his schemes and executing the same with vigor, the Christian church has put itself in a situation where two prayers of Yeshua seem unanswered, while in reality there is enough human resources to complete the Great Commission in our time. We mention some of these things in the course, but the Lord, in the way he gives us a com uh, this commission, it is that certain truths are declared, and in other lessons they are amplified, they are expanded. In Matthew 9, 35, Yeshua went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep without shepherd. Then said he unto the disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers, a few. Plenty of harvest, few laborers. So, for that, he says something. He says, Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth his laborers, he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The Lord said, Look, the harvest is huge. The people to do the harvest, the laborers to bring it in, are few. So, pray the Father. To bring in more laborers. Now, I want you to understand what we're saying. The laborers we are praying for, we are asking the Father to send, are already in the church. That is one of the central key uh, pillars of which the Global School of Ministry was established in 2006. After 10 years of process, 2006, he asked us to launch her because he said the, the laborers the church is praying for are inside the pews called laity, doing nothing. They're being consumers of the anointing on the men and women of God, or mainly men of God, and then being just there, warming benches, bringing tithe and offering. And in John 4, when the disciples of Yeshua ask him to eat food, he said, look, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And then he told them something in verse 36. Of verse 35, say ye not that there are yet four months and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. The harvest is ripe. It's not about tomorrow, it's today. And you know what? We should be open to see and embrace all who can emulate Yeshua going forth towns and villages, teaching, 
preaching the gospel of the kingdom, who can heal the sick, deliver the oppressed, and, you know, we should be embracing all such, because that will be signification that they are called by the Lord. We shouldn't be engaged in limiting acceptance to only male adults. Brothers and sisters, all believers who he calls and anoints should be embraced and it will include everyone, everyone, notwithstanding their ages, their gender, their place where they are. So let's look at how the church has loaded that loaded gun Satan gave. Let's see how the church has exercised it, the body of Christ. One, the creation of a religious dichotomy featuring a tiny priestly caste of male clergy who are only qualified, the only them are qualified to act as mediators between a holy God and an unholy people. A vast majority of Christians are regarded as unholy laity, not qualified. It's only for people who have done seminary. Ten years in the seminary, seven years, they've learned Greek exegesis, they've learned Hebrew, they've learned how to interpret all that and all the grammar and all the things. You know what? This negates the strength of the church and its ability to be an instrument of fulfilling the Great Commission because Yeshua called his body, his bride, all without exclusion. The second bullet deals with negating of the ministries of saints who are called to the marketplace. Those who are in business, in the professions, those who are in public service, those who are in the civil service, those in employment, those who are self-employed, by, you know what, taking them out and regarding them as doing secular work, just bring your tithe and offering, and not regarding them as people in ministry, ambassadors of the kingdom in the marketplace, the church shoots itself in the foot. The third one is the abnormality that the youths are rarely embraced as fit for ministry by religious leaders. And what they do, young people go to school, nursery, pre-KG nursery, primary, secondary school or high school, university, get a good qualification, get a good job, you know, stabilizing the job, get a wife, get a husband, marry, begin to rear children. And then when you're in your 40s, yeah, and we can talk about you and ministry. So the idea of taking a 20-year-old as call to serve the Lord and 19 year old or 21, 22 year old, in some places there's just no room at all. There's no room at all. They're pushing to, if there's a conference, the outdoors are in a conference and the youths are pushing to side rooms to go and watch what will excite them. Men and brethren, when you now top off these three bullets, Satan put in the gun and gave to the church to shoot itself, now add it with the Top it up with the rejection of women as fit for ministry in a world where sons of Elohim in female bodies are being fulfilled in all areas. Medicine, you see them excelling. The man goes to the woman who is a doctor. He tells the woman all his issues, nothing which held back, nothing which held. You know, if he goes to the office and there's a woman engineer, the engineering issue that they are facing, they take it from them. Even some nations, the women are prime minister or president. The people just take everything they say. Then in the church, the women are asked to just stay at home, just bearing children, just kitchen, work, only that. So what has happened? Brothers and sisters, this work is tracing the reality that these four things that the church has taken on the work of Satan, whose job, if he can't fight the purpose and program of the law frontally, he gives, he finds a way around. And by accepting the dichotomy of some as clergy, some as laity, the vast majority laity, in some places 90%, 95%, some 99%, and the tiny professional male clergy, 
rejecting the marketplace ministry, rejecting youth ministry, youth as called to minister, rejecting women, the Christian church has put itself in a very untenable situation. And if you are in a place where women are not discriminated and received, praise the Lord for you. It is an exception of the rule. Now let's look at world population trends and the Great Commission. We're taking a baseline of some statistics uh, taken from geohive.com, which was quoting the world population as at 2010. Well, if you know about population, you know there are really dramatic changes, trends. So using that baseline, you can take the trend till today, so many years after. As at 2010, and we need to say something that will shock you that there are more men than women in the world that take note of that. So as of 2010, there were 6.8 billion people, 6.89 billion people, almost 7 billion. On a global level, the males were 3.47 billion and the females were 3.418 billion. Okay. Now, number two thing is that you need to know why we was more, there were more men than women. A simple two nations basically and a few others are responsible for that skewing those two nations are china and india and a few other nations okay now we took something note of something from what you have presented which is number three nations which have ideologies or religions that are strongly opposed to the kingdom in the atrium or christianity as some will call it they tend to have a higher number of men a greater number of men than women wow so as they are caught up in the tendency in such places for men to see women as created for their pleasure and to live for them there's a general suboptimization of the female population in many such places with official or unofficial ceilings that limit upward mobility. We rely on these estimates by right? you have 2010 to make, to, to, to kind of present what we're saying. For instance, China is a communist nation with great emphasis on maleness. Out of a dense population of 1.341 billion, 100, uh, one out of that population then 1.341 that's the population then it had 696 million 340 752 males and to that 696 males million males it had 644 994 400 females India a Hindu nation with a population of 1.2 billion, then 1.224 billion, it had 632 million men, 632,546,781 males, and 592,067,546 females. Egypt, an Islamic nation with some tolerance for Coptic Christians, had a total population of 81,121,077. The male were 40,733,602 and the women were 40,387,475,101 females. Saudi Arabia, strongly Islamic uh, uh, kingdom, had 27,448,086 population. population, out of which 15,196,000 132 were male, while 13,212,251,954 were female. Now, you need to see that is the nations where Christianity rejected, they had higher males than females. Now, it's interesting to know that in Western nations and places where there is no institutional rejection of the gospel, there is a tendency, on the other hand, for the population to have more women than men. Is this a coincidence? I throw not, as the Bible will say. United States of America, as of 2010, had a population of 310 million, 383, 948 people. The 
males were 153, 139, 563, while the women were 157, 244, 385. France had 62 million people population, 62 million, 787, 427. Out of them, 30 million, 548, 615 were males, while 32 million, 238, 812 were females. United Kingdom had a population of 62 million 035570. The males were 30 million 515530, while the females were 31 million 520040. So, men and brethren, it is important to now take note, number five, that in the nations where faith in Yeshua is not subject to negative sanctions, there is a large pool of human resources, male and female, that are already saved. Okay, they believe in faith, they have faith in Yeshua to some extent. If their strength is properly harnessed, male, female, the fulfillment of the Great Commission in this day and age will become a reality. If the ramparts of organized religion are torn down and all available personnel are deployed, there will be enough laborers to take the gospel even further and deeper. That's very important. So six, the world population does not reveal another reality, which is that the church, in the church, most saved people who are faithful devotees of most denominations and congregations are women. Men and brethren, and we're talking in some places about 70% women, 30% men, 60% women, 40% men. Very rarely you see 55 women, 54, 45 men. Only very few congregations where you have that kind of, you're getting close to 50 something, 40 something. Generally it is 60, 40, 70, 30 in favor of womanhood. They are more consistent in attendance. They are more engaged in discipleship. They are, they are the least used, yet they are the least used in kingdom as kingdom resource. More women are hungry to respond to the call of the master for the Great Commission. Unfortunately, because of misconceptions based on the wrong interpretation of those scriptures we dealt with in the last two lessons, given to resolve, those scriptures were given to resolve specific challenges about order that arose in the Alpha Church, most females have been held down. And those who dare to respond to the call of the king are derided, profiled as rebellious, sometimes persecuted and harassed. Even on Facebook, we showed you, we told you in the previous lesson that somebody in South Africa put a, a poster and put at the back of the car, women pastors are an abomination, they shall repent or they will go to hell, you know, and one of our sisters was telling us in a class yesterday how people harassed her on Facebook that she's a false prophet for being in ministry and ministering publicly. So what is the way out of the pit? The way forward is simple. In the last chapter of the gospel, the least we owe the Lord who has set the fulfillment of the Great Commission as a benchmark for his return is to harness all available human resources and deploy them strategically across the world. Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. You want the end to come? You want the Lord to return? You got to be concerned about fulfilling the great commission, tearing down the walls or across the world where people cannot penetrate. So we need to understand that there are nine critical experiences every believer should have that signify the Lord has called them. Number one, the person should be converted from a sinner to a saint, genuinely born again with a testimony, John 3, 3 to 9, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Number two, every believer who, every believer should be consecrated to be a real vessel for his holy and soul use. And Romans 12, 1 to 2, Galatians 2, 20 consecrated to the Lord. Three, every believer should be committed to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Matthew 6, 19 to 34. Four, every believer should utilize, sorry, 
every believer should press into the fullness of baptism with Holy Spirit. Acts 1 8, John 7 37 to 39. Then 4, uh, 5 rather, every believer should utilize the root or basic spiritual gifts given when they were sealed into Yeshua. No, rather, let me recast this. Number 4 should be that. When you are born again, you are sealed into Yeshua according to 2 Corinthians 1.22, Ephesians 4.30. And with that seal, there are some root basic gifts that are given to you. I'm not talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Every believer should discover those root gifts and begin to use them to serve the Lord, to serve the people, to serve humanity. Then five, every believer should press into a fullness of Holy Spirit. The baptism, Acts 1.8. John 7, 37 to 39, because with it comes the enabling gifts that with which we are going to serve the Lord. Six, every believer should enjoy intimate communion with the Lord in a vibrant prayer life and personal relationship of holiness unto him which is real. 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16. This state of heart is made possible not by might or by power, but by the experience of sanctification, where the Lord, by His Spirit, by His Word, does another work of grace that takes away the Adamic nature, that nature that makes this disposition to sin, to be, to be filled with unforgiveness and many things. It can be taken away. That we have a heart that loves the Lord and loves people in spite of what they say or do to us. Number seven, every believer should enjoy communion with other saints through fellowship. Hebrews 10, 25. Number eight, every believer should respond to the call to serve. John 15, 16. Matthew 16, 24 to 26. And number nine, every believer should live in consciousness that the ultimate end of our faith is to live in eternity with the Lord. That's why we pray that kingdom come. You know, many believers no longer pray that prayer. Thy kingdom come. That will be done on earth as in heaven. Listen, that is something we must. It's at the heart of the Lord's prayer. The framework Yeshua gave. John uh, Matthew 6, 10. Is thy kingdom come. That will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need daily to submit to the governance. The government of Yeshua. Every day pray for yourself. Your family members to submit to the government of Yeshua. Not only that. That his kingdom will also come. In terms of the return of the Lord. We should be praying into it. If we pray into it. Our heart is locked into it is going to help us to make certain decisions it's going to help us to avoid certain things that are not profitable men and brethren and so these nine things anyone who has these nine things is called by the lord we are not supposed to be looking at gender age we're not supposed to be looking at whether they're in full time or marketplace we're not supposed to be looking at whether they are uh, young people or whether they are old people we should just have this framework. And that's why the Lord said in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Yeshua after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man is in Yeshua, is a new creature, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The one new man of the Elohim is neither male nor female. The one new man of Elohim is not known by age. Is not known by full time or part time or, or pulpit or hybrid ministry. It is that these nine things, you have them, you are pressing into them. You know what? You should be given the facilitation to enable you to get into ministry. So these steps above are important for these things to happen. The way forward. One, Christian religion, which is that emphasis on attendance, building cash, is un understood for what it is. It is a weak alternative to the gospel of the kingdom. It is a bewitchment which Rome injected into the spiritual as a spiritual virus to limit the ability of the church to be fully optimized as the body of Yeshua in the earth realm. Two, Normal ministers trained in the old seminary and theological college or Bible school traditions with all the distortions of the truth and all the academic things they add and denominational slant they receive, what happens with what they study is a spiritual glaucoma. Their eyes, though they have eyes, they can't see fully. They can read the scriptures. They can't see the essence of the scriptures. Three, 
realizing that the Lord is raising up his remnant to tear down all rampants of religion, you know what? We, our mandate is like that of Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.10. See, I've said it this day, over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. So number four, the remnants now, an urgent assignment is to build according to the pattern that Yeshua gave. Paul, people limit him to those three scriptures. Paul wrote extensively. Romans, Galatians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, wow, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. Go and read the readings and writings of Paul. You come away with an understanding that the gospel is a radical departure from religion in that all are called. Your gift and calling determines your calling, the Mel order of Melchizedek. So, men and brethren, that means number five, the remnant need to engage with their eternal souls and specific destinies by deliberately giving room to those who are walk in the fivefold calling, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, to bring in their multidimensional understanding of the word into them, because when it is brought in, you will come to the conclusion of Galatians 3, 26, for you are all children of Elohim by faith in Yeshua. For as many of you as have been baptized into Yeshua have put on Yeshua. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Yeshua Hamashiach. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed according to the promise. Same principle in Colossians 3.10 and put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision, non-circumcision, barbarian, Scythian, born nor free, but Yeshua is in all, Yeshua is all and in all. So it means that our focus should no longer be these carnal things, old, young, rich, poor, you know, whatever, but our focus should be what has the Lord gifted people to be? What have they, what has he put in them? And he has put it in them. Just as in the day of Pentecost, 120 were in the upper room. They were male, female. They were young, old, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So also the current church age, everyone the Lord has put a gift and calling in. We have no reason to limit them because of their gender or age or any other thing. So what it means is number seven, therefore, if we grab what the Lord is saying, is that the church is organic. Number six, the church is organic, is a living, loving organism, and everybody is gifted to function, and we should be ready to receive and to release to others, receive from them, receive, and not looking at the agenda and all that, because that's the New Testament church. Number seven, saints will realize that what matters most is their spiritual maturity and stability, which comes from being led entirely by Holy Spirit in all they do, not their flesh. Because as Romans 8 says, the flesh, if the flesh leads, one is carnal. And a carnal mind is enmity against Elohim. So we come to Romans chapter 8, 14. As many as are led by the spirit of the Elohim, they are the sons of Elohim. Whether they are male or female, doesn't matter. Old or young, doesn't matter. Marketplace or pulpit ministry, doesn't matter. As long as Holy Spirit is leading and guiding them. Brothers and sisters, for the above reasons, number eight, for the above reasons, the glass ceiling imposed by religion and its limited understanding of the Holy Scripture should not be permitted to constrain women from answering the call of Elohim to serve him, to serve the kingdom church, to serve humanity. It is so important we understand these principles. Romans 8, 32, I mean, sorry, John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth you know shall set you free. Verse 36, if the Son of Man therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. There should be no limits to women to serve the Lord. 
Galatians 5 1. Stand therefore in the liberty wherewith Yeshua has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Remember, we are talking about serving the Lord. We are not talking about the framework of the Levitical system or the Nimrodic system. We are talking about the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. This is really what it's all about. So please, would you share this video and encourage others? We're going to have another lesson today, lesson eight. We're building up the fullness of the case of what the Lord has revealed that no one should be limited from serving him because of the agenda or their age, because of their uh, socioeconomic situation. The Lord has called all his people. So please share this video with friends and relatives and share on Facebook and other platforms. And the Lord bless you. By way of assignment, number one, by re we take a quote which we gave at the beginning. By rejection or by rejecting the general call of Elohim on all saints, negation of the ministry of those in the marketplace, the youth and women, and insisting only limiting the, 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 the ministry and leadership functions to only male-dominated priestly caste. Religion has been doing the bidding of Satan. Do you agree? If yes, why? Two, please summarize the seven critical experiences that all saints, I mean the nine critical experiences that all saints should have to qualify them in ministry. And, you know, can you just summarize them? There are nine of them mentioned. You don't have to go into too much detail. Just mention them in, you know, in a bullet point form and maybe give some scripture references. Three, summarize the eight-point way forward for women in ministry to come out of religiously imposed glass ceilings. Brothers and sisters, let's continue to take this systematically. Nobody should be limited from serving the Lord on account of the gender. It's not the New Testament. What Paul wrote was for a specific purpose. We need to understand it. We need to embrace it. And we need to know it's for good. It's not also an oppressive thing to ask women to be subject to their husbands. It's not an oppressive thing to say, hey, show yourself that truly you are under authority. That the man is subject to Yeshua. The woman is subject to the man. The Lord put it in for good purpose. We're still going to discuss some of these things in good sort of time. Let's study. Let's pray. Dear Lord, here we are. We have released what you released. Holy Spirit, take over to plow the heart of men and women, young and old, of all kinds, and cause us to come into understanding and bear fruit thereof, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, that all honor and glory be ascribed to you in Yeshua Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for being with us on this program and watching and we believe you learned something and the Lord bless you. Now it's time to connect with us on our social media platforms. We have a daily live stream on Facebook, Monday all the way to Sunday, every day by about 10.30 a.m. UK time. And that's the same at Nigerian time. And you, it's either Apostle George, Monday to Friday, uh, to Thursday, Pastor Grace, uh, Friday to Sunday and then in the evening of Sunday we have two sessions from 5.30 to about 6 after 6 another one up to 7 so please join us on the live stream and you're going to enjoy it we also visit our website www.gsom.ac to download free ebooks this course you just listened to all these lessons you know there's an ebook we have free of charge everything we do is free but more importantly you can actually do your program on you know ebooks you can do your program entirely on ebooks and with this video or anyone you want you can also if you want to do the yes course or be, do the master class you can go to www.kingdomboostclub.com and you can subscribe so that you can do it you can also subscribe to our channels this youtube gsom.tv and we also have a telegram channel gsom media you can send us an email at aklife.tv at gmail.com we love you dearly and we want to partner with you to make sure that the body of yeshua jesus is empowered with truth remember it is the teach 
train, equip, activate, and release Paradigm. Absolutely free of charge. Have a blessed day, and we'll see you again soon.